then live load surcharge again it's a part of earth pressure like whenever there is a vehicle or person or anything that's acting on the soil that would be again that's a live load that there will be a surcharge because of that so that needs to be accounted in our design then we have centrifugal loads centrifugal loads will come into picture when our bridge is in a curved like uh, where the radius of curvature of a bridge is significant that's when the centrifugal loads come into picture right few years back in mumbai there was a collapse of superstructure so that bridge or that superstructure was having a radius of curvature of 200 meters it's very curvy we can't just ignore that so th the reason for the main collapse was the centrifugal component of the load was not considered appropriately and there was a transfer pre stressing which in addition to that uh, centrifugal force it was a design fault so that's what my point is so while designing this aspect was not considered properly and which led to the collapse of that superstructure a span of a superstructure right so it was very highlight in during that time when it fell but yeah we need to be very careful we can't just ignore the centrifugal loads when it's in radius of curvature is very less seismic loads we have so many seismic nowadays it's gaining more importance because nowadays there is frequent earthquakes throughout the world earlier whichever countries whichever cities have been placed under zone 1 now they have moved to zone 3 because of various activities which is below the soil i mean it's causing more frequent earthquakes so again there are a series of procedures how to consider seismic load and everything again in this ppt we are not covering any of this calculation of these loads so don't worry i won't be boring with you about how we are calculating each and every part of fellow next hydrostatic loads again this hydrostatic this comes into picture when there is a water right when there are trace of water below the bridge or when our bridge is situated in a water vicinity so that time this hydrostatic loads come into picture okay as i mentioned i would discuss more about live load so if we look into irc6 with a loading code india you can see this particular drawing here which looks something like our tanker here right so this is what i mean i was always wondering when would i be getting this kind of load i mean will this kind of load actually comes into picture so there are possibilities like recently we had an what we call we had an uh, at the border of india and china we had some aggressive movements during that time if you want to move our tankers to that place then if a bridge is not considering this particular load here there is a good probability that that bridge could collapse under this and this would create a more dangerous situation for the country's defense so in india on code it is called class a tracked vehicle so just for your understanding i'm just showing the tanker here which looks something familiar so like this there are other loads which needs to be considered there is a class a vehicle and there is class b then irc class a wheeled load basically these are different loads with different load values so while designing a bridge we can't ignore even one load i mean one class vehicle also all class vehicles all vehicles need to be model i need to be run on our bridge before coming out while carrying out analysis we can't ignore a single load right okay so till now we have gone through like what is bridge engineering and how bridge is classified how i mean what are different parts of a bridge and then what are the various loads that act on a bridge and what happens if they are not constructed properly so we all have gone through that now let's take a simple case study of a slab bridge which is simply supported i will just briefly explain you what this particular drawing looks like or what exactly i am trying to show here 
you can see this is top view or we call it a plan it's a plan it's a slab bridge it you can see the 20 meter span right that's a span of a slab and it is five meter width and this red portion rectangle these are nothing but our crash barriers right and this blue color lines rectangles right these are our piers and this is how our bridge looks when we look from the top so let's take a section here and see how it looks in our elevation okay this crash barrier again you can see the red one and this is our slab which is 500 mm thick and uh, center to span is 20 meters and our pier is 1.5 meters thick and the height of pier is 7 meter right and uh, called pile gap so earlier i mentioned you about foundation right so in this particular example the foundation is from this pile cap and the piles that acts as a foundation and the substructure is this particular pier and the superstructure is above this and there is some bearing which is i told simply supported right so it's just a elastomeric bearing which is situated here one thing which needs to be seen in this picture is there is a gap here right so here is a gap and there is a gap here and that's how i'm trying to make here this simply supported have they been connected here then it would be a continuous bridge again there's a different approach when it's a continuous for making it uh, simple i am keeping it as a simply supported bridge right so we are going to design this bridge right so we're going to do it so before doing it let's see one more brainstorm time so when we say what is our intention when i say design or when i say analysis what exactly i mean by that this particular bridge can be used by different very complex softwares like we can use softwares like Statro, Midas, Lusas or any other different complex complex softwares we can go on using them but at the end of the day if you see when I say design what exactly I will be looking for out of all these softwares the output which I'll be looking for is a bending moment for a slab what is the bending moment at the center span here? So what is the maximum bending moment I'm getting at this point? And again, one more thing is the shear force. So at some at the distance from this face or at the face, what is the shear force I'm getting? So with all these softwares, whatever stunts, whatever uh, complexity we can use at the end, this is what we would be looking for. So for the maximum bending moment, you would be providing the steel reinforcement if it's a concrete slab bridge, right? So that's what I would be looking for a bending moment and for a shear force based on the requirement, whether it would be providing a stirrups or inclined stirrups or best, that's again the requirement. So these two are the main things for a simple case study we would be looking with any softwares. So now I am not going to in detail because of the time which have been given here so what i will be doing is i will be showing you how we are providing or how we are doing reinforcement detailing for this particular bridge so what you are seeing here is our slab just ignore these looks like a line i mean this is supposed to be a dots but due to some error so don't worry about the values whatever 12 at 200 28 200 whatever have been so from our figure from our earlier case study plan or we can see that it's a simply supported right so basically there is one support here and one support here and when you apply various loads and this is how it will bend right so when it bends at the center we will get a maximum bending moment and for that what is the requirement so here it is telling this particular below line you can see that's a main reinforcement for this particular slab here that it's been arrived as a 20 20 millimeters bars at 200 mm spacing we will again in the design we will cross check whether the minimum area of steel is less than this or more than this right so 
the intention is we should not be providing anything which is less than the minimum area of steel required. So for this slab bridge, here is a maximum moment we'll get. So the bottom bars, that was really the main reinforcement for this particular slab. You can see these dots or these lines, small, small lines here, right? So when we are getting a maximum moment and that to at bottom part, it's going to bend, then why are we providing the reinforcements at the top? As I mentioned earlier, the temperature stresses, there is distribution. So there will be other factors wherein our bridge might behave or might bend in some other direction, or you can see. So we generally call these a distribution steel. That is for each slab bridge, the code proposes minimum this percentage of steel has to be given as a distribution steel. Whether it is requirement or not, it has to be provided. So the top portion, what you are seeing is, that's a distribution steel, right? So here again, the shear reinforcement, in this view, it's not visible because it's not required for this particular bridge. And this is a slab, right? So generally the slabs, generally, they don't require shear reinforcements, generally. But there are cases wherein we will provide shear reinforcement even in slab also. Again, that's a requirement basis. So from this example, what you can make, what I'm trying to tell you is that the behavior of the slab, it's like this is how it behaves and that's where we'll provide the reinforcement. Next, it's a cross section. You can see this particular line in this view, when we take a section here, it will become, a, you can see the dots here. Just to show you how it looks in the other direction, how the reinforcement looks in the other direction. And earlier I was telling you something about the curve, right? You can see this is a curve we can call. It's a handrail and it's a curve. And you can see how the detailing has been done here. It's something like a C with extended, right? It has, to. again, the codes there comes with various detailing procedures, like at least this is the shape of reinforcement we need to provide minimum. Why we need to provide? That's because before mentioning it in a code, there was a series of research and experiments have been carried out. And finally, they arrived that at least this is a kind of shape has to maintain in order to serve its purpose. So that's all about superstructure. That is our slab in our case study. And let's go a little bit down. You can see here, this is a pier. And you can see the uh, elastomeric bearing, which I was telling earlier, right? So in pair, how the reinforcements are provided, right? You can see the reinforcements are cut at here because it's a simply supported and the reinforcements are cut at here. <clears throat> I mean, what I meant is this line is not going above this into the deck slab. That's because it's simply supported and this is how it's... Again, you have so many places, I mean, in the course mentioned you, What's the maximum spacing between these two dots can be? Or again, what's the maximum? They are all been given in the codes. But my intention here is to show you how we detail a bridge uh, typically, right? That's my intention here. In pier, you can see there is the pier bends in this direction, right? And it's a cantilever. You can see it's a cantilever. So the main reinforcement would be this one. These dots are just a horizontal because it's our continuous piers, right? So it's a length. So those are the dots, again, the core maintenance. But I'm coming to pile cap here, right? You can see these are the two piles which are visible in this particular cross section. And these are moving it up. So basically, this part will be, the main reinforcement would be given in this part and in this part, because it's again, the cantilever, you can see it bends like this. And accordingly, we will calculate. So how we calculate, it's a very big procedure because for each simple bridge, we will tell you know, series of steps, hind loads, hind combinations. And in one in combinations, you'll be taking one forces leading means other four will be accompanying. So there'll be like, hundreds, 500, thousands of load combinations will be there. Whichever causes a serious effect, that would be considered for our design, right? And this pile, how we generally give detailing here is, there will be 
it's let's say it's circular pile and you can see here so the code generally says for a pile minimum at least of six number of longitudinal bars should be there you can see this line here those are the six and this horizontal you can see these are either it can be circular links or helical springs you can see something like snake shape kind of thing so that's what is helical kind of thing. okay with this i would just say that this case study is not for how to calculate it's just to sh to understand you how the reinforcement should be given it's just a rough example in this one you can see the dowels right again the code says how much length it has to enter in this pile cap so that it will act as anchorage so all will be there which should be dealt when we go into the exact calculations right? okay with that we completed our case study which is just give you a rough view about how detailing is done and next let's see how about latest technology or latest advancements in our field especially the drones like whenever i go to any marriage i couldn't see the drones taking photograph of the couple and everything. so other than that where exactly drones are used how drones are used in bridge right or how drones are used in any infrastructure project now a separate field has emerged like this topographic survey i mean the surveying has been revolutionized by drones so the drones now they are using it for planning even the survey of the entire topography and they map it what exactly i mean by map so when they take the photographs and the videos with the softwares they are going to superimpose one on another and they can make it a 3d topography the interesting thing here is we can actually measure do what our calculations whatever we can need it from a topography that all can be got by this mapping so now we have an interface wherein we can extract the data captured by drones right what i meant i can just give a simple example let's say that in any particular area we're going to lay some pipe here okay so that i can view it from this map and i can virtually calculate how much of volume i need to remove so that everything can be done through this map and even drones they are used nowadays for refurbishment of bridges so there is some existing bridge which needs to be rehabilitated or reconstructed or to be given extra support so what is the present status many of the times you can see people doing circus like what exactly they are trying to take a photo with i mean the place would be very remote or it may be above the ocean like so there is a problem of approaching so in those places now drones have been used and they are taking photograph videos everything of that and they are converted into maps and one more revolution it is created as built like once the structure is built we will provide as built drawings earlier we used to provide as built drawings but now with the help of drones it will just take the photo and the video and we can make as built drawings to that itself so that's application of drones here and next i mentioned about ar vr augmented reality and virtual reality so this is gaining more importance now when we are having or when we are while bidding or when you have conversation with our clients like the client would be very interested to see how the structure would be when it is constructed before constructing itself the client would be interested how it will look like so that's where ar vr comes into picture now, now it is so developed that in virtual reality we can measure the lengths we can get the area we can get so many other functions are there now the client can ask you okay what would be the length of this particular beam when it's constructed no even you can measure it there itself in the virtuality so that's the advancement we have reached now and autodesk and bentley software products so these are the major two software industries in our field 
Autodesk and Bentley, they are doing a lot of automation works. A lot of research has been going there. In Autodesk University Conference, you know, every year this Autodesk conducts a, like AU20. Uh, recently, AU2020 has happened. So in AU2015, in 2015 itself, they showed that they were able to build many buildings which are uh, rehabilitation buildings somewhere in Africa. They were able to, the entire design, everything has been done within three months. Whereas in other countries, they take years, like just for a design itself, they will take it in years. And this Autodesk, they didn't approach even a single consultant. Everything they did with their softwares, right from modeling to the design, everything can be done within those softwares. There is no use for consultants. So that's the power they have again that's the power they have approached now and it's a continuous process they keep on researching and they keep on working on it so that's what's been happening and digitalization so now civil engineering is being disrupted by digitalization that's a heading you can see wherever right so what exactly they mean by digitalization now there is automation like earlier we used to work through our papers drawings were in the hardcore copies and then now we are just submitting a 3D model itself and the site engineer will has a tablet in his hand and he can just look into the tablet and see what's the dimension or what's it, how exactly it looks like. That's again digitalization. So this digitalization is now engulfing our civil engineering and there's so much going on in digitalization. Right from automation to everything, the survey, everything, everything, topographic survey, especially there is a lot of distillation going in environmental field as well as geotechnical. So next career path and job opportunities, career path, right? So this, our field is a constantly evolving, right? It's not like just one day we are at the top and another day we are at the bottom, something like that. It's just constantly evolving. Now that digitalization is happening and you can see there is too much things to do in digitalization. No, generally when we always have a tendency to compare with the other, what do you call it, other departments, especially the computer science and everything, like suddenly they would jump into the high and the next time they'll be found. So ours is something like a bamboo, right? So it takes three years for a bamboo plant to come up above the ground. Just to germinate itself, it will take so three years. But once it takes, it's like it goes up to three years, you won't see a thing. You won't see a leaf on the top of the soil. But after three years, it would just within the span of one or two months or three months, you can see the entire bamboo in its height. So that's our civil engineering is some, it's always correlated in with that. So what are the careers? Like if you join any design company, so what are the, what are the opportunities you have? Like how far can I go with as a bridge engineer? Again, it depends on you because in every MNC, in any companies you see, there will be always opportunities for you to divert. What I meant is in technical, if I want to be fully technical, so you can see there is a technical director or technical advisor in each MNC. Right? So that's a position you can reach. And then no, if I'm not interested fully going to technical, I want to go towards management. So even in many MNCs, you can see a managing director would be from civil engineering background or bridge engineering. It's not necessarily to be MBA person. So this, so there basically it depends on the individual to which path he chooses, he or she chooses. No, I'm not interested in civil or any civil related. Neither I'm interested in managing. All I'm interested in is software coding. Okay, now coding languages such as C, C++, Python, Visual Basic, etc. Earlier they were considered as an added advantage in your resume, but now it is a requirement. Many companies are recruiting with the people who has coding skills. They want it because automation for digitalization, everything they require coding. And if you are a person with that skills, your chance of getting into it would be first compared to a person with no coding skills. So now it has become must. You need to, whether you like it or not, if you want to work in a design company, your coding skills are required. So with that background, let's see where, what are the various companies in India. 
so this i would try to list as much as i know and it is not limited to these companies there are so many other companies which i may not be aware of but i try to highlight what are the general companies which we generally hear about this so you can see lnt is there already it's an indian company and then there is jacobs and then there is two snc lavalin now atkins is a part of snc lavalin then there is arcades then we have acom there is wsp india which is a major construction company in the world one of the top most construction company in the world and then we have hindustan construction company then these rvnl and rights these are just something like public sector companies in india like you can see rail because nigam limited so they are also undertaking design as well so this list should give you some brief idea like if i want to become a design engineer or if you want to become a so which are the companies we have what are the options we have it's, these are the options you have right okay with that i would conclude my presentation for today